You will walk with me into the high places, says the Lord, for we are living in a day and season where the Lord is doing great things amongst his saints. And you are my saints, says your God. Yes, you are my saints, says your Father. And I will bring you to a place that you have not known before. Yes, it may be different, says God. Yes, it will be different, says God. But trust me, says the Lord. Stop leaning on your own understanding. Stop trying to figure things out with your natural thinking. You must get into the word of the Lord, says God. You must read my scripture, says God, because it's there you will find your place, says the Lord. So look to me today. Look to me today as I minister to you through the servant of the Lord, because I have a word for you, says God, but you must take it by faith. You must take it by faith. You must run with it. You must walk with it, and you must do all that I have called you to do in these last hours, says the Lord your God. For I am the one who strengthens you. I am the one who anoints you. I am the one who gives you the grace and the power and the anointing to do what you cannot do without me. Stick close to me, says the Lord. Stick close to me. Stop paying attention to the world. Look to me. For I've taken you out of the world. You are in the kingdom of God now. Stay close to me, says the Lord. And I will protect you as I always have. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just thank the Lord for his word. This is his word. Thank you, Jesus. Great day plan today. The Holy Spirit has a great day plan today. Amen. We have a wonderful family here. Steve, Pastor Steve and Roseanne Brower here. You, you heard... Roseanne, she spoke the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen? You know, how many people know that when the word of the Lord comes upon you, and when you know that you know that you know that you must speak it, you know, nothing, no demon in hell can stop you from saying that word. Amen? Amen. I was, I was reading this morning, you know, this is, this is like so, a synopsis of Jesus was talking to his disciples, as always, and this is in the book of John 14.10, and he said this, he said, Dude, don't you believe that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me. The words I say to you do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is my Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe. And this is the part that got me. Jesus is speaking to the disciples. They hear his words, but they still believe that he's just speaking words, that he's just talking. He's just talking. He says, if you don't believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, at least believe what the, in the miracles that you see in front of your eyes. In front of your eyes. You see people getting, that the sight being restore, restored to the blind, the lame walk, the dead raised. I, this struck me so hard because so many times in my life I have to fight my own intellect and my own mind and even my own soulish realm, which is my mind, my intellect, my emotions, this lousy mind can get in the way of faith. And Jesus knew it. He said, if you don't believe that I'm in the Father or the Father, at least believe because you see me doing these things. That's really paraphrased. But that's what it is. You know, Jesus did miracles right in front of them, and they still struggled. And sometimes I scratch my head and I say, wow, I would have baloney. I would have been doing the same thing because the words he was speaking, right, the words he was speaking were, they were life. They were spirited. They were, li they were alive, but they, they were never used to it. They were used to religion and bondage and the law that they tried to keep, but they didn't, the words of life, he, they, he would spring forth out of his mouth. And he said, listen, if you don't believe I'm in the Father and the Father is me. And at one point they say, show us the Father. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And at that point, he said, believe in what I'm doing, people. <laughs> you don't believe it, look at what's happening. You know? It's just amazing. So I just felt to share that. I don't know if some people are in the same place I am. I want to get my mind to line up with my faith. Right? Sometimes there's a, there's a chasm there and, and, and a disconnect. It's a disconnect. And it's believing. Right? It's believing. Things you don't see. Right? And what we hope for and things we don't see. The evidence of things we don't see, but we have to believe. 
Amen. <laughs> Amen. I just I, I so praise God. I'm blessed to be here today. Thanks. You all ready for a word? It's all he sent me here with. I have nothing else to bring. I have no sandwiches with me. I want to thank Pastor Jessica for inviting us. You know, it's always a pleasure to to come and minister the Word of God. This is what I do. This is all I've done for the last 29 years now. So, the Word He gave me to share with you, the title of the message, is Fear Not, Stand Still, and Behold the Salvation of the Lord. And friends, you know, what I come with today is kind of a nuts and bolts message from the Word of God. I'm not a theologian. I don't come quoting all this theory. I come with the Word of God. It's all I've got to give you. But can I tell you something? It's all you need. If we can just get a hold of the Word of God... Everything in life will radically change. It did for me. But the Lord just impressed something upon me I got to share with you, having nothing to do with the message. The Lord just impressed upon me that he's going to be shaking things up. You know, my wife makes this drink in the morning. There's got to be a dozen things that get thrown in the blender. Each one of those things individually is, eh, it's okay. But after you put them all together and mix them up in the blender, it changes color, it changes form, and it tastes delicious. So somebody here, it's got to be a word for you, for somebody. The Lord's going to be shaking things up. Things are going to change in your life. The shape, the form, the routine of your life is going to radically change, but it's going to be for the better. Don't fight the process. Just expect and believe in the results. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm done. We're going home. Praise God. Church, you've got a great pastor in Pastor Jessica. I just want to share that with you before I get going. She's a woman of the word. She oppresses me all the time with her knowledge of the word. And she loves you all very much. Listen, what she's going through is not easy. I commend her for it. And she wouldn't do it if it weren't for a call on her life, a call of the Lord, and a love for each and every one of you. You know what she wants? She wants to see you all walk in the word, not just talk in the word. Amen? And friends, one of the most important results of walking the word and not just talking it is getting the victory over fear. That's really the message that the Lord has me sharing with you today. We got to get the victory over the spirit of fear. Billy Graham once said, the key is to learn to trust God. He said, no matter what our fears are, and we can trust him because he loves us, and he's greater than anything we'll ever face. He's, God is greater than anything we'll ever face. I, I can attest to this. Listen, for, I don't know, for quite some time now, months and months and months, I've been in a, a lot of pain. I have, uh, the doctor calls it osteoarthritis in both knees, but particularly the left one. And, and I tried the cortisone shots, and, the, you know, they worked for an hour and a half, and the pain was back. Um, we, I got cortisone shots before we left for our, Cruise. We had a nice cruise for our 50th anniversary. Man, I hobbled all over the Caribbean. <laughs> y 
yesterday, climbing the stairs, which I shouldn't be doing at my church, I got to the top and I said, wow, my leg doesn't hurt. My knee doesn't hurt. And I've been pain-free ever since. But, you know, the way this works is that I pour the word into me all day long. My office upstairs in my house, I call it the mountain. I'll get up, I'll have a cup of coffee, and I go to the mountain. And I'll stay on the mountain until my face is glowing, like Moses. Amen? I mean, not literally. Come on. I light up the den. Friends, it's, it's, it's the word. We've got to get the word in us. The enemy is going to use fear. Every opportunity he has. Come on. This pertains to every one of us here. The enemy comes against every one of us. And, and, and his whole the ploy is fear. He tries to cause you to freeze in fear. You know, that's why lions roar. Do you ever wonder why a lion roars? What does he make that sound for? Listen, fear can and will paralyze you. Amen? It, it'll keep you from believing God, and it'll keep you from stepping out in faith. The devil loves a fearful Christian. Now, I read something about lions roaring. And, it, and the article said they roar to, to strike fear into the heart of the prey. Now, lions, you know how loud they roar? This was stunning. They roar as loud as 114 decibels, and they can be heard up to five miles away. Now, in this article I'm reading, the man that wrote the article said he, was, he discovered this while he was on a safari in Africa. And he was sleeping in a tent. And in the middle of the night, he hears this, <clears throat> excuse me, he hears a rustling in the bush. And suddenly, he hears this god-awful roar. He said it awakened him instantly. He sat straight up, terrified, in his tent. And, and, and it says this is exactly how a hunting lion wants to find its prey, frozen in fear. Listen, 1 Peter 5 and 8 in the Amplified says, be well balanced, temperate, sober of mind, be vigilant and cautious at all times for that enemy of yours. Whose enemy? Yours. That enemy of yours, the devil, roams about like a lion, roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. Oh. He doesn't want to just injure you. Devour means to consume and spit out the bones. That's what it literally means. He wants to tear your flesh from your bones and spit him out when he's done. Scary thought. But greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Friends, fear. Fear is a debilitating and incapacitating spirit. It's not just an emotion. Don't write it off as being insignificant. Fear is a spirit that comes upon us. And listen to this. Many times your victory is on the other side of that fear. Church, there was a man named Job. Job was the wealthiest and most influential man of his day. Job had 10 children. He had immeasurable wealth. He had immeasurable servants and huge flocks, thousands and thousands of just camels alone. But friends, in like no time at all, he lost it all. 
All 10 children were killed. All his wealth was gone. His flocks were all stolen. He lost it all. But how was the door opened to such evil? Well, I want you to hear these words that describe the mindset of Job. In Job uh, 3 and 25 in the Amplified, it says, For the thing which I greatly, this is Job speaking, the thing which I greatly feared comes upon me, and that of which I'm afraid befalls me. Job said, the very thing that I fear is what's going to kill me, consume me, destroy me. Those are true words. Now, this word fear doesn't mean only to be afraid of something. It means to reverence it, to revere it. So what was Job really saying? He was really saying that he gave greater credence to the enemy's ability to harm him and destroy him than he gave to God to protect him and keep him. Are you all here? Come on, we can't fall into that mindset where the things we see and the things we think and the things we smell and taste speak more loudly and more meaningfully than the word of God himself. When you start giving the devil more credence than you give God, you're in trouble. And it's never too late, but it's time to turn things around. It's time to turn the tables on the enemy. That which he feared did come upon him. Friends, the enemy rides the wave of fear. He he barges through the open door that fear opens and he brings in all kinds of dreadful things. But I want you to remember this. Fear is the absence of faith. The two of them can't occupy the same place. Just like sin and righteousness can't occupy the same place. Friends, at one time or another, we're all going to experience fear. It happens. It comes upon us. Sometimes you get a report, and it'll just stagger you. But the key here is acting to quell that fear not allowing it to persist. And then you got to release your faith. Listen, faith will always prevail. That was a great word that Elder Tom brought this morning. Faith, we've got to believe. It's not enough to hear. That's where faith begins. Then we have to accept it. we got to stop thinking for ourselves, and allow the word of God to dictate. No, I don't think you're with me on this. Listen, at one time or another, we're all going to find ourselves in, in situations that require us to reach really deep into the word of God, into that word that's been stored in our hearts perhaps for years. This is what's so wonderful about the word of God. You can store it up in your heart. And then when you reach for something, you come up with a weapon. Not cotton candy. Listen, one of the greatest examples of what we're discussing here today is seen amongst the Israelites as they were fleeing Egypt. Pharaoh, after everything that he went through, I mean, Moses kept bringing him a pile of stuff, didn't he? plagues and everything else. Finally, Moses said, all right, all right, let him go. And then he said, wait a minute, what do we do here? I think we made a mistake. Go get them back.
To get him back, he sent his entire military, the whole army, all his chariots, all his horsemen, all his foot soldiers. So here's the Israelites. Moses leads them to a place that some say was the greatest military blunder in all of history. He leads them to the Red Sea. Here's a sea in front of them. There's a mountain on each side of them. And to the rear of them is Pharaoh's army coming. There were so many chariots, so many horses' hooves, so many foot soldiers that the earth could be felt moving under the feet of the Israelites. That's a scary situation, huh? The spirit of fear was running rampant in that place until God sent his word. God spoke. He spoke through his prophet. Oh, friends, don't despise prophets. I'm going to read to you from Exodus 14. So if you got your Bibles and you care to join me, I'll see you there. Exodus 14 and 9, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It says, the Egyptians pursued them. All Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army and he overtook them and camped by the sea by Pi-Haroth in front of Baal-Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. Listen, and they feared greatly. Huh? They feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, it, it is because there's no graves in, in, in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Is that why you did this? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Moses was a prophet. So when he spoke, he spoke what? The word of God. This is what he said to the people. Fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For the, listen, for the Egyptians whom you see today, listen, listen, you shall never see them again. Oh, my goodness. The Lord will fight for you. And you only have to be silent. In the King James, it would say, shutteth, upeth. Fear not. Those are the first two words. Fear not. Don't allow yourselves to be overcome, overcome by the spirit of fear. Yes, it's going to come but don't let it overcome. Amen? Paul urged young Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 and 7. He said, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. This fear, when it comes upon you, you better know it's not of God. But instead, God has given you power and love and a sound mind, sound mind. Friends, fear, fear. It will bind you. It will incapacitate you. It'll render you essentially unable to secure a victory. Fear is of the enemy, and it only serves his purposes. The second part of that, after fear not, he said, stand still. This often reminds me of Fred Sanford in Sanford and Son. He'd grab his chest and he'd say, it's the big one, Elizabeth. And he'd stagger backwards. As he staggered, it would, wouldn't take much more than a, to blow him over. That's where the enemy wants to find you. He wants to find you unstable, easy to knock down. And in many cases, that's where he does find us. But that's going to change today. 
We're not given in to fear anymore. Fear has no place in a child of God. Friends, the faith of God's people, after hearing this message, fear not, stand still. The faith of God's people enabled them to walk through the Red Sea. I, come on. I marvel when I go into the city and I got to drive through one of those tunnels. And I'm always thinking, oh God, don't let it fall in now. Come on, I know none of you ever had that thought either. You know. Yes, I've seen the water dripping. I don't like what I see. So here they are, standing in front of the Red Sea. The army behind them is getting bigger and bigger and bigger on the horizon. The mountains on each side are just as immovable as they were before. Some would say, your goose, sir, is cooked. But no. You see, what they didn't say, see was the Holland Tunnel that was under the water. It was there. We just can't see it. You see, because there's certain things you're only going to see by faith. You're not going to see certain things in the natural. That's why you need faith to perceive them. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Not seen. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I've never seen the Hope Diamond, but there is one. It was the faith of God's people that enabled them to walk through the Red Sea. And listen to this, on dry ground. So that means God not only parted the water, but then he dried the place. So they shouldn't walk in the mud. Only to find at the end, Pharaoh's whole army dead and washed up on the seashore. God said, this enemy, you'll see no more. Could they possibly have thought that God was going to do this? No. Could they have imagined it? No. This is beyond our imagination, isn't it? This is exactly what God does. He does exceeding abundantly. Above all that we could ask or even think. They found that out. Church, hear me when I tell you today that standing firm in faith will get you through. Amen? Standing firm in faith will bring about the manifestation of the promise of God, no matter what it looks like and no matter what it feels like. Look at Abraham. 25 years, 25 years after God told him he'd be the father of many nations. He did something interesting. He believed it. He did something else interesting. He took it literally. Just the way you should be taking the word. And he believed for those 25 years so that at the end of it, he was 75 years old when God gave him the promise. At a hundred, Isaac is born. At 90, Sarah gives birth to him. She was not only 90, but she had a dead womb to begin with. Now, friends, I want you to think about this. In the natural, the longer it took, the less likely it was to ever come to pass. They weren't getting any younger. She wasn't getting any more fertile. But listen to this. I want you to hear the mindset of Abraham. This has got to describe your mindset. Romans 4, 18 through 21 in the King James 
speaking of Abraham, says, who against hope believed in hope. When everything said, this is hopeless, he said, no, it's not. This word hope, as it's used here, is not cross my fingers, maybe yes, maybe no. No. It, the, the word that was used in the Greek is elpis, E-L-P-I-S, and it means to confidently expect. So no matter how hopeless it seemed in the natural, Abraham still confidently expected God to perform what he said. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And, verse 19, being not weak in faith. Abraham was not weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead, even though he was 100 years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. It doesn't matter. What did God say? Can you get a hold of this? We've really got to stop judging God's word according to your own understanding. Oh, that can't be. What do you mean it can't be? What, what, what would you have thought when God stood in the midst of, as the, the message Bible puts it, the soup of nothingness, in the very beginning, when there was nothing at creation, when God stood in an absolute vacuum of darkness and spoke and said, let there be light. What would you have thought then? Light? What's light? Oh, that's impossible. He can't do that. God can do whatever God wants to do because he's God. He's supernatural. And we often try to judge the validity of supernatural God with our Measly little natural minds. Doesn't work. Being not weak in faith. Verse 20, he staggered not. He, he didn't do a Fred Sanford. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He was strong in faith. Listen, giving glory to God. So all that time when people would say, oh, come on. Abraham, A.B., you're 97 years old. You're still believing you're going to have a, a child? Oh, glory be to God. It's coming. He kept glorifying God at 98. A.B., what are you, crazy? He says, I believe God that it shall be exactly as he said. At 99, A.B., you're my sugar to A.B. said, I stand on the word of God. I shall not be moved. At 100, they all heard the cry of a baby. Glory be to God. Come on, what can you believe for? Anything God puts on your heart. That's the answer to that. It's not whatever you can conjure up in your own mind. It's whatever God says to you. It's whatever God reveals to you. It's whatever he said in his word. You got to know the word and apply the word to your own life, to your own circumstances. The word says of the word that it was said for you to find it. That's what God says of his own word. It doesn't matter how long ago it was said. It's how long ago you found it. Now, are you going to stand on it? Friends, Abraham's absolute faith produced an absolute miracle. Amen? A baby to parents 190 years old and barren. Friends, this word today is for you. God sent this word for you. Come on, when you're faced with a battle, how do you judge whether it's going to happen or not? By what? Logic? Oh, God forbid. By probability? Based upon what? Your understanding? Or the integrity of God? We need Smith Wigglesworth thinking. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. There's nothing else to talk about. Oh, I know some of you are thinking, yeah, sure, this guy is radical. Yeah, yeah. When it comes to the word of God, I'm radical. 
I don't think that it's subject to my interpretation. I think it's subject to my belief. Another great example is shown when King Jehoshaphat and all the people of Judah were about to be attacked by a number of nations that came together against them. And over which they admittedly had no power. That's what Jehoshaphat said. Lord, we have no power against this great enemy. But the Holy Spirit brought them a word. And it's interesting that the word came through a young person. Didn't come through some old stuffy uh, theologian with a beard down to his knees. No. Came through a teenager, a young person. The Holy Spirit worked through him like a hand puppet. Spoke through him and delivered a word. And that word was, you shall not need to fight in this battle. That's the best kind of battle, by the way. The kind you don't need to fight in. But listen to the words that he shared. You see, there's something about God's word. It's cyclical. It never ends. It just goes round and round. The same word spoken in Exodus 14, here many, many, many years later, is spoken to Judah. And the Holy Spirit says, set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord. See it, see it, see it. It's not enough to theorize it. It's not enough to say, yeah, well, God said. No, you've got to expect it to come to pass. He said, you don't need to fight in this battle. Set yourself, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. Then he said, fear not, nor be dismayed. Why? Because fear will nullify the faith it takes to receive the victory that you need. He said, tomorrow go out against them. What? Wait a minute. Didn't you just say we don't have to fight in this battle? So why are you sending me to the battlefield? To see if you have the faith to go. You see, we've got to stop questioning God's intellect. I noticed I didn't get one amen to that. Thank you. Hey, friends, here it is again, right? Set yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Don't fear or be dismayed. This salvation that he's speaking of, you know what the Hebrew word is? It's Yeshua. It's Yeshua, which just so happens to be one of the names of Jesus. Yeshua. Stand still, fear not, and see Jesus show up in the midst of your battle and he's going to slay your enemies again and again and again and again. Yeshua means, literally translates rescue. It translates to deliverance, freedom from trouble. This is part of the definition. He's your help. It means health. It means safety. It means to be saved. Friends, what's actually being said here is that if we set ourselves, position your feet so that you're immovable, stand still, not stagger or retreat, not fear or be dismayed, then you'll come to see, see Jesus in the midst of your every battle and adversity. You know what this word see means literally? To behold. And you know what that means? To possess. Where you can see it in your hand. You know what it is? A tangible. God wants salvation to become a tangible in your life where you can see it, experience it, feel it. It means to have it, hold it, and handle it. That's what God wants you to have. 
He wants your salvation to be that real to you. Your deliverance, your, your freedom, your health, your prosperity. It's all part of the meaning of salvation. God wants you to have it. Church, your Yeshua will always make a way. The same way that he was the fourth man in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He'll lead you and accompany you through the fires and the battles in your life. If, if you believe in him, if you trust in him, and if you surrender to him. Friends, the Lord would have me leave you with these words in your heart and thoughts to stay always on your mind. Remember this. These are not empty words. Do you hear what I just said? Tom touched on that earlier too. These are not just words. These are God's words. These were divinely constructed. They're, they're, they're vessels, they're carriers that he's delivering into your heart and your life and your circumstances. Listen to this. Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 in the Amplified says, for the word that God speaks is alive. It's alive. And it's full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. God's word is effective at altering the circumstances. God's word is effective at destroying your enemies. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line between the breath of life, the soul, and the immortal spirit, and the joints and the marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of our hearts. And not a creature, listen, not a creature exists that's concealed from his sight. But all things are open and exposed, naked and defenseless to the eyes of him with whom, capital W, we have to do. Friends, God's word is a force. It's a force. This force is to be carried and experienced, executed in the obedient thoughts, and purposes of his people's hearts. When God's people obeyed God's word and they chose to face adversity his way and not theirs, I want you to see the results in both cases that we discussed today. The king and the people of Judah, they heard from the Holy Ghost. But plenty of people hear and don't do anything. They heard. And when he said go, they didn't think about it. Early the next morning, they packed up and they were on the road. They didn't think, listen, they didn't think that this is important. I want you to get this one. They never thought that the odds were against them because God said he was with them. There were no odds against them. If God be for you, who could be against you? So they never set out thinking, oh boy, this is going to be an uphill battle. No. They sat out saying, God is going to slap the tar out of these idiots. They feared not. They stood still and they beheld the salvation of the Lord. They saw it. They possessed it. They held it, handled it. Amen? The salvation of the Lord. And listen, when they arrived at the battlefield that he told them to go to, as far as the eye could see, there was nothing but dead bodies. The armies of all these nations turned against one another, killed one another, and God, the word says, works all things together for good, doesn't he? Not only did they not have to lift a, a sword or, or fire an arrow, it took them three days to pick up all the guilt. The spoils of the war go to the victor. Three days it took them to gather up all the spoils, the jewels, the clothes, everything of value. Three days. Then there was the Israelites. Faced with the Red Sea before them, the mountains on the side, 
Pharaoh's army to the rear. When they got to the other side, what did they find? Nothing but dead bodies again. Nothing but dead bodies. Friends, as the Lord promised Joshua, and he did. Listen, here's what he said to Joshua. In Joshua 1 and 5 in the New Living Translation, and I want you to take this as a word to you today. Are you hearing me? This is God speaking to you today. Every one of you, no matter what challenge, what adversity you might be facing. And you know what? You might, even know it, might not even know it yet, but the enemy might have something coming. Be prepared for it. Amen? This is what God said to Joshua. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. This is God's word to you. Amen? Friends, God's word to the Israelites is his word to every believer. The Egyptians, the adversaries, the enemies, whatever they are, that you see today, you will never see again. Friends, I challenge you to stand in faith. I challenge you to fear not, to stand still, and to behold the salvation of the Lord. Are you ready to stand in faith today? I mean, come on, it's time to change the course of our lives. It's time to change our course so that we arrive at our destiny. Amen? Would you stand with me? The Lord is looking for a people that will stand in faith, that will stand immovable, and that will stand expectant. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these people. God, I thank you for each and every one of these, your children. Father, I thank you that they've heard your word today. And Lord, I thank you that your Holy Spirit has gone before the word to prepare every heart to receive the precious seed of your word. Lord, may it produce an abundant harvest in every life represented here today, an abundant harvest, an abundant fruit, Father, in every need represented here today, in every home represented here today, in every hope and every dream. God, we call dreams and hopes restored here today by faith in your word, Lord, by standing on your promises. Oh, God, you'll let, let, let none of us be ashamed, but instead you're going to perform and deliver exactly as you said. Before I close, if there's anybody... Listen, we're the, the Lord is challenging you to stand in spite of what you see, to stand fearless in spite of things that are going to try to instill fear in your heart. Before I leave and say amen, if there's anybody here today that just needs a touch from the Lord to be able to stand fast, come now before I say amen, and we'll, we'll pray quickly for you.